Good evening and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees. Here's tonight's top story. American actor Alec Baldwin fired a prop gun, killing one chief crew member and wounding director Joel Souza on the set of his new film. We hear from experts in the film industry about how this shocking event could have taken place. Also tonight, many young people around the world are worried about how climate change is going to affect their future. This worry has become anxiety and is affecting their daily lives. And then uh, on a maybe slightly darker note, you realize, well, the only way I can ever really have a minimal impact is if maybe I just didn't exist at all, which is not a particularly pleasant thought to have. And could this be the supermarket of the future? Tesco have launched their first contactless only store in London. Shoppers are able to bypass queues as well as checkouts. It's emerged that American actor Alec Baldwin fatally shot a cinematographer when he fired a prop gun on a film set in New Mexico yesterday afternoon. Police say no charges have been filed, but they are investigating. We hear from two experts in the film industry who say safety measures when using guns on sets are rigorous. Entity's David English brings us this report. Hollywood actor Alec Baldwin fired a prop gun on a film set on Thursday, killing one person and wounding another. Authorities say the incident occurred during the shooting of a western Baldwin was working on in New Mexico. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot dead and director Joel Souza was injured. Much of Hollywood paid tribute to Hutchins as production was halted on the film. Stephen Hall is a director of photography specialising in action sequences. He says firearms protocols on film sets are very strict. I've never experienced what I would consider to be reckless behavior uh, with firearms on set. Um, and I know after the Brandon Lee shooting in 1993 that things improved dramatically, I must admit. Uh, you can't even have a replica weapon or a dummy weapon on set now without having a licensed armorer. Hall says a blank is unlikely to kill at a moderate distance, but badly made blanks can cause dangerous misfires. What surprises me um, is that two people uh, were injured, sadly one fatally, um, and that, that does puzzle me, I must admit. Um, a blank would have to be pretty powerful to injure two people, um, yet alone kill someone. Armoury coordinator Sam Dormer says there are multiple protocols in place when using blanks. Nowadays, all weapons are checked, the barrels are checked before any blanks are put into the weapon. Um, there are lots of other protocols in place, uh, including actor training beforehand so the actor is competent with the weapon before they go on set. Police say no charges have been filed, but they are investigating the shooting. In 1993, Brandon Lee, son of the late martial arts star Bruce Lee, died on a film set after being hit by a bullet that was supposed to be a blank. David English, NTD News. Buckingham Palace is saying today that the Queen was back at her desk in Windsor Castle on Thursday. This comes after she spent Wednesday night at a private London hospital for preliminary investigations. The Queen had to cancel a visit to Northern Ireland on Wednesday. The palace said she had reluctantly accepted medical advice to rest for a few days. This came just days after the 95-year-old monarch was seen using a walking stick at a public event in Westminster Abbey. She had previously been photographed using a cane in 2003 after knee surgery. The Queen's next major engagement is at the end of the month when she is due to welcome world leaders at the opening of the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow. Many young people around the world are suffering from climate anxiety. They are worried about the future and how climate change is going to affect their lives. They feel guilty, sad and powerless. Some have even been pushed to the point of questioning their own existence. Is entity's Joanne Robson with the story. 
Many young people around the world say they feel sad, guilty and worried when they think of climate change, a state now known as climate anxiety. Eloise Mayle, an ecology student at the University of East Anglia, is one of them. She says it all started when she read a book about social justice movements. And I finished it and I just cried and, and cried and I was feeling incredibly isolated and overwhelmed that so many people were trying to do so much and I felt completely paralysed and unable to contribute to any of it. Mail says she's worried about many climate-related things. Food being in plastic or not in plastic, um, trying to always find food of outside of plastic, but then of course that's an accessibility issue. A lot of supermarkets have food in plastic. Should I have bananas? Because they're, they're brought by um, from a different country. Is that fair? Should I have those? Mail says sometimes she thinks the only way she can have a minimal impact is if she didn't exist. What I'd be left with is maybe the sense of shame. I was like, how dare you still want lovely things when the world is ending and you don't even know if you're going to have a safe world to grow old in. Like, what are you doing? Mail is not the only young person with climate anxiety. I think anxiety is just the new name of the game for my generation and future generations. Yes, I'm worried about the climate change. I think definitely yes. Uh, being part of the society in the 21st century, I think it's very hard to um, ignore the they're increasing climate problems. I definitely do. Um, I definitely do feel anxious about it. I don't know what it means, what the future holds for us. Yes, but it's it's quite worrying. A study published in September shows being worried about the climate is a global problem among young people. Funded by an online campaign network and led by the University of Bath, the study surveyed 10,000 people aged 16 to 25 in 10 countries. 25% worldwide think the future is frightening. Four out of 10 are hesitant to have children because of climate change. And over half, 56% of children and young people worldwide think that humanity is doomed. This study is said to be the largest of its kind. It shows nearly half of the world's youth say climate anxiety and distress are affecting their daily lives. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Five police officers will face disciplinary action over messages linked to Sarah Everard's killer. One of the officers will face a misconduct meeting after the police watchdog found they used WhatsApp to share with colleagues what it called a highly offensive graphic that depicted violence against women. Another officer will also face action after he allegedly shared the graphic without challenging it. Everard's killer, Wayne Cousins, was jailed for life last month. He faked an arrest to abduct Everard in South London before raping and murdering her. A separate investigation found officers from several police forces breached standards by using Signal to share information linked to Cousins' prosecution. Tesco opens its first contactless shop in London. Customers can pick up items and walk out of the store uninterrupted as a supermarket's app will automatically deduct the correct charge from their payment card. This report comes from NTD's Cost Terminus. This Tesco store on the edge of the city of London is the first from the supermarket chain to go fully contactless. No scanning, no checkouts, no queues. It opened as a get-go shop on the 19th of October. The weird part was when you're inside, you definitely don't feel like you're doing a normal shop initially. And leaving was, uh, was amazing because I, I felt like I was stealing. <laughs> a simple but unusual experience for most shoppers. The Israeli technology works thanks to cameras in the ceiling and weight sensors on the shelves. Especially with weekly shops, you're just busy. You just want to get it done and go home, really. Um, so I think it would be so much easier if we could just grab everything, come out once, and it's just automatically charged to, to someone's card. Tesco says no employees lost their jobs as a result of the change. And customers are reassured that their privacy will not be compromised. When you take something from the shelf or you put something back on the shelf, we track it and we understand that. And we recognize exactly the product. And when you walk out, we just send you the, the receipt. Uh, very important to say that everything is completely anonymous. Uh, we blur faces and we don't know any uh, 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 data about you, about the shoppers. For now, this is just a trial in a single store, but the concept could catch on quickly. 
In the city centres, the reason I think that this will be rolled out more is because retail space is so costly with rent and rates and the checkouts really don't service any sales need other than to process the sale. This shop isn't the first to go contactless in their capital. Amazon launched their own version six months ago. Cost MNS and TD News. As reports emerge that Facebook is about to introduce a new corporate name, citizens from around the world offer their suggestions. Espionage Book and Facegram were among the names suggested by people from Berlin to Hong Kong. NGD's Our Roads has more on this. Facebook is planning to rebrand itself with a new group name. US technology magazine The Verge reported on Tuesday. The organization is under fire from regulators and lawmakers over its business practices. People worldwide offered their suggestions for the new name. Facebook will change its name? I'll tell it you in Calabrian dialect. The face of shame. The face of shame. For Facebook and An appropriate new name for Facebook? Espionage book, I would say. We are not big users of Facebook, I must say. Basically, I don't really care. So if Facebook decides to call itself something else, it is still the same in my eyes. In my own. No idea. <laughs> to be honest, something like for lazy people, something like Facegram? Facegram. <laughs> Facegram will be fine for me. I'm not surprised they want something fresh. But it's weird because everyone knows Facebook, so it doesn't make sense. Uh, Facebook is just the obvious because of all the allegations that have come out about how they're using data and how they're hiding their own studies and whatnot, they're probably just trying to do damage control and whatnot, as well as because they're acquiring all these new things, they're releasing new glasses that have cameras in them. I think Facebook wants to change its name because they want to change their brand image. Facebook has had a lot of negative news in recent years, so they don't want people to associate the company with Facebook anymore, especially since it also has Instagram and Snapchat under the same umbrella. Facebook said it doesn't comment on rumour or speculation. The Verge says the name change will be announced next week, citing a source with direct knowledge of the matter. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. Ice skaters now have one more chance to enjoy the seasonal ice rink at London's Natural History Museum. The festive event returns for a final time at the iconic venue after a 16-year run. And today's No Word Ray brings us the story. The impressive Natural History Museum overlooking the ice rink with its 30-foot Christmas tree makes for a superb venue for some skating fun. But this year will be your last chance to enjoy the surroundings with your blades. This, for so many families around London, is a, a tradition that they come every year. I think that when you see people coming through the gates, families and friends smiling, this is why we do what we do. And at this iconic venue, it's hard not to see why people would come down to this venue and skate beneath the lights of the pea, pea lights and the trees and around this amazing Christmas tree. It's been hugely successful over the years and our partnership with the museum has been amazing. Uh, we've truly loved being here. The Natural History Museum plan to transform this space into what they call an exemplar of urban wildlife research, conservation and awareness. It'll form part of the Urban Nature Project, a national drive to re-engage people with urban wildlife and the wider natural world. But for now, it's a place to practice your skills or just enjoy the ice in the open air. You've got until January the 16th to come along and grab some winter enjoyment. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. Still to come, a French senator says universities are vulnerable to influence by the Chinese Communist Party. This comes after a new report highlights the efforts of the CCP to use education as a form of warfare against Western countries. That and more after the break.
The EU Parliament says the European Union must deepen its ties with Taiwan, despite strong opposition from the Chinese regime. An overwhelming majority of lawmakers in the French city of Strasbourg voted in favor of a resolution on Thursday. They called for the EU to urgently begin preparations for a new bilateral investment deal. Lawmakers also demanded changing the name of the bloc's trade office in Taipei to the European Union office in Taiwan. That's even though neither the EU nor its members have official diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Lawmakers also urged the EU to do more to address the escalating military tensions between Taiwan and the Chinese regime and protect the island's democracy. Taipei's defense minister recently warned Beijing will be capable of mounting a full-scale invasion in four years. The Chinese regime views the self-ruled island as its own territory to be taken by force if necessary. According to military experts, education is a part of Chinese Communist Party hybrid warfare against foreign countries. A French senator says this threat is very serious in France, as the government spends much less money on protecting universities' independence than the CCP spends on infiltrating them. Entities France correspondent David Vives has the story. Universities in France are vulnerable to influence by the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. That's according to Senator Etienne Blanc, who's part of a commission that measures CCP interference on French campuses. He said that the Chinese regime efforts are underestimated and could pose a serious threat to the university's independence. If we compare our means of defense with the Chinese means to exert Beijing's influence, China's means are really considerable. We have to find new ways to protect ourselves. The senator quoted a 650-page military report released in September on Beijing's influence operations. The report highlights the continuous efforts of the CCP to use education as a form of warfare against Western countries. In 2018, a Chinese university director addressed teachers who would be sent abroad to Confucius Institutes, saying their goal was to integrate the red DNA and spread it to future generations in Western countries. Aside from the institutes, there is another method of warfare that may be even more dangerous, the monitoring of Chinese students. In 2015, Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping said at a conference that Chinese students in foreign countries are a priority target for monitoring and that they should be prevented from being infected by Western IDs. The military report quotes examples of different strategies used on Chinese students when they speak out against the CCP while abroad. The regime might have their parents arrested in mainland China or make them the target of cyberbullying campaigns by other students who work with the CCP. And the increasing number of Chinese students who attend universities in the US, Europe, Canada and Australia can be used as powerful leverage for warfare, according to the report. Senator Blanc says it's important to recognize the methods used and the threat of CCP in universities. The CCP considers our system to be not good for people, for humanity. It constrains, forbids, threatens and uses violence. For us, this is fundamentally incompatible with who we are. We think the opposite, that our system is good, that it protects people, that it protects humanity. David Vives, NTD News. To Germany, where three parties that hope to form the next government said on Thursday they aim to have it in place by early December. They know that they have a complex task and will have to find creative ways to finance their election promises after agreeing not to raise taxes. We've got more from NTD's Kost Temines. The three German parties working to form a new government aim to wrap up their talks in a month. Party officials said on Thursday they hope to have a new chancellor soon after that. We are very ambitious because we want to have an agreement by the end of November, which will then allow us to elect a chancellor for Germany in the week of December the 6th. Bundeskanzler für die Bundesrepublik Deutschland zu wählen. The Chancellor is elected by the Bundestag. If the negotiations succeed, the new government will send outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel's center-right union bloc into opposition after 16 years at the helm. Her successor would be Olaf Scholz, the current finance minister.
he propelled the center-left Social Democrats to a narrow election victory last month. The Social Democrats, Environmentalist Greens and pro-business Free Democrats opened formal coalition talks this week. This is a complex undertaking. It is bound to get entangled at times. Anything else would surprise me. So far, the talks have been relatively quick, unexpectedly harmonious and free of leaks. The mood is good, but we know what a responsibility we three parties now have to successfully and quickly begin coalition talks and bring them to a conclusion. The parties have pledged action against climate change, including an exit from coal-fueled power by 2030. That's a key green demand. Since they have agreed not to raise taxes or relax restrictions on running up debt, they have to find creative ways to finance that and other promises. Other plans include an increase in Germany's minimum wage. Cost MNS, NTD News. Going to Russia, where President Vladimir Putin said on Thursday that Russia could quickly boost national gas supplies to Europe via the new Nord Stream 2 pipeline as soon as it gets the green light from Germany. The first pipeline of Nord Stream 2 is full of gas, and if the German regulator gives approval tomorrow, supplies of 17.5 billion cubic meters of gas will start the day after tomorrow. The controversial pipeline, which runs under the Baltic Sea to Germany, is owned and operated by Russian state-run energy giant Gazprom. The European gas market has been grappling with tight supplies and soaring prices. Critics accuse Russia of withholding supplies to exert pressure for quick regulatory approval. Putin denies using energy as a political weapon. Germany's approval process could take several months. To Latvia, the government there has introduced strict lockdown rules in order to manage record high COVID cases. Citizens face an 8 p.m. curfew, and most events and gatherings are now forbidden until mid November. Entity's Malcolm Hudson has more on this. Latvia's government has declared a state of emergency until January next year and a strict lockdown until the 15th of November. It comes after a record of almost 3,000 new cases and 23 COVID-related deaths in one day. 4,000 COVID patients at the same time would mean that our health system, as we know it, would collapse. It wouldn't be able to help vaccinated people with different diseases or urgent needs. The strict lockdown sets an 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew for everyone except for those traveling to and from work. Private and public events and gatherings, except for funerals, christenings and for people of the same households, are forbidden. Some people blame the unvaccinated for the lockdown. There are mixed feelings. Those who are vaccinated are angry with those who are unvaccinated. They think it is because of them that these restrictions are here. But overall, those who are closed now will have losses, and there is no belief that the government will cover these losses. So far, about 50% of Latvians are fully vaccinated. After the lockdown ends, people without a vaccine certificate or a certificate of recovery from COVID still won't be allowed to attend events until January 2022. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News. And finally, Big John is the largest triceratops dinosaur ever discovered by paleontologists. The skeleton just sold for over 5.5 million pounds at a Paris auction on Thursday. Entity's Joanne Robson brings us more on this. Big John roamed modern-day South Dakota more than 66 million years ago. It's named after the owner of the land where the dinosaur's bones were found. It's being acquired by an American collector, and that individual is absolutely thrilled with the idea of being able to bring a piece like this uh, to his personal use. The first piece of bone from the supersized skeleton was found in 2014, and by 2015, paleontologists had unearthed 60% of the skeleton, a rare feat. The skull alone is over 8 feet long and 6 feet wide, and over 200 pieces were painstakingly put together in preparation for the auction. It set many records as far as being the, one of the largest and one of the most intact pieces that exist out there. The auction house estimated the skeleton would fetch roughly £1 million, but the hammer price before commission and other costs was just shy of £4.7 million. 
A T-Rex skeleton auctioned for around £23 million in New York last year. Big John sold to an unidentified US buyer. We still don't know his final uh, destination because uh, we, we only know that it's a private individual, but we have no idea if that's meant to be donated or loaned for long-term uh, uh, terms in, uh, in a museum. Joanne Robson, NTD News. That's the news for today. Have a good evening. Thank you for watching our daily news show on YouTube. You can also watch our other programming on Channel 190 on Sky TV or on Freeview via Channel Box on Channel 271. In the meantime, though, please give this video a like and hit subscribe to our channel. Have a good day.